Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I do this because I truly believe that we as a community, as a, as a humanity, have so much to learn from our First Nations people about connection and respect. Well, today we are going to explore the fundamentals of life, quantum biology. And my guest is Dr. Jalal Khan. Now, Jalal is the founder and principal dentist, or rather he describes himself as an oral physician, and I can certainly understand why, and you will too, of the dental station in Sydney, Australia. He's also founder and CEO of The Dental Truck. Now, this is an extraordinary initiative, a charity focused on providing comprehensive mobile dentistry in communities in need. He visits the outback with his dental truck, and I will have more information about that at the end of the podcast. But Jalal's real passion lies in understanding how things work. And this has led him down the road of a philosophy and concepts such as decentralization, the quantum realm, and how this all applies to the individual and the society at large. Now, that sounds like a big, tall order. But as I've said many times, as the world we live in becomes more complicated, the solutions are remarkably simple. And you will learn that is accessible to you as well. Above all else, uh, Jalal is a deeply committed family man, credits his family with providing him the motivation to break out of his self-proclaimed previous mental inertia. Well, I, I definitely met Jalal after he had done just that. He certainly wasn't in any mental inertia when I met him. And I was so impressed and so inspired by what we discussed and I wanted to share that with you today. It is so fundamental to a healthy life and also so fundamental to why preventable chronic diseases are the problem they are today. Look, I've been in practice for 42 years and to meet Jalal about six or 12 months ago was a truly inspiring uh, thing for me and I was so looking forward to sharing him with you. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Dr. Jalal Khan. Welcome to the show, Jalal. Thank you for having me, Ron. Jalal, a pleasure. Look, you and I have known each other now for, I think, almost a year now, and uh, I've so enjoyed our interactions and our conversations. I have personally learned so much, and I had to share you with my audience. Uh, I was just interested, uh, you see life, well, what is the lens through which you look at health? Because you are a health practitioner like I am. Uh, how, do you, how do you see health? So uh, the way that I look at health is to understand the the system that we're working with. So the human body is fundamentally a quantum thermodynamic system. Now, that's a big phrase for one to wrap their head around. And admittedly, it's taken me several months to really understand it at a deep level. But in order to understand what that phrase means, I guess it's important to define what is the target for someone that's on a health journey. And so the target is rightly so optimal health. So what does that look like? Because I feel there's a, a lack of definition being uh, applied to this target of optimal health um, in, in the health space. And for me, optimal health looks like a flow state. And it's a flow state where that system can harvest energy from the environment. And there's three sources from which we can harvest energy, that being the sun, through the photoelectric effect, food, which provide us electrons, as well as the earth, which provides an endless supply of electrons um, uh, inside the earth, so via grounding. So if you've got this environment which is able to supply you all this energy, you've got to be able to harvest it, you've got to be able to store it within your body, and we use our water networks as a capacitor to store that energy. And then we should be able to disperse that energy and use that energy on demand. And so that means if there's a voluntary action such as running after, running away from a lion, for instance, we should be able to call upon the energy stored within our water networks to drive that function. Or it could be an involuntary autonomic function such as peristalsis itself. 
But regardless, it's those three things, harvesting, storing, and dispersing that energy on demand, which to me typifies the flow state that is optimal health. And to make it even simpler for your listeners to understand, when someone is lacking in energy, struggling to wake up in the morning, they know something's wrong. If they're gaining weight uncontrollably or losing weight uncontrollably, they know something's wrong. And these are all signs of thermodynamic inefficiency. And so the thing is, is that when you look at thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics basically says that a system is always tending towards a state of entropy. And entropy is fundamentally chaos. And so the beauty about life is that we are actually able to make order from this chaos, which enables us to live for several decades, if not more than 100, particularly in blue zones and for those that are living healthy. And so how are we able to skirt this second law of thermodynamics and live for such a long time? And um, this is when the quantum aspect of a quantum thermodynamic system comes in, because what we are able to do is we are able to harvest information, not just energy, but information from our environment. And it is, it is the information which um, is really in the form of a sense of time, and we sense time via light. So it is introducing light into our system that enables, uh, that enables us to order all the molecules in our cell and order all the tissues in such a coherent way so that we have this global quantum coherence inside our body where every cell is acting autonomously yet at the same time for the benefit of the entire tissue and in the entire organism so that's kind of the lens that i look at um the human body through and um it can get complicated and so i um, I mean, we're talking quantum physics and quantum electrodynamics and understanding how light interacts with electrons. We're um, talking about Albert Einstein's theories such as E equals MC squared. But uh, these are all fundamental to the way that we operate. And it has been a massive paradigm shift for me as a health clinician to go back and study these things completely self in a self-directed way in order to better myself so that I can serve my patients um, in, a be in a better way. And I mean, when I start to talk to patients about this, it can get pretty confusing for them. Um, so I kind of use the, uh, the economy as a, as, that we yeah. participate in as a, as a way for, for them to really understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it is so interesting, isn't it, that when you think about, and I often do think about, us as individuals on a evolutionary journey from the beginning of life, say 500 million years ago, and the beginning getting up on two legs as Australopithecines, whatever, and our journey to up to about 10,000 years ago, our interaction with the ground on which we walked and the food which we had access to and the sun, which thankfully came up and down every single day, it, we didn't even have to think about that because that's how we evolved. But, uh, but the last few thousand years and particularly the last few hundred years, we've kind of moved so far away from that and it's easy to forget. <clears throat> we, we sometimes need to go back to basics uh, and that is what we're really talking about today. But you mentioned also you see the economy as a way of mimicking what's happening biologically and you use Tell us a bit about that. So, um, I mean, what is an economy? Really, it's a, it's a place where there's a transaction of goods and services, right? Um, and so someone might be working on a construction site and they're putting time and energy into their, into their work. And they want to be able to use that time and energy to transact with someone else who's providing time and energy to provide another good or service. And that might be buying meat from your local regenerative farmer. Um, and so how can, how can that person A convey how, the time and energy that they put into their job to person B in order to access said good or service? And um, they have to have some sort of currency in order to convey that. And that's really fundamentally what money is. So the currency, whether it be notes, coins, digital, it is, money is essentially information. It is, a, it is a representation of the value that you have provided 
and so that you can show that to other people and obtain an equal value. And so in our body, there is a economy of electrons and protons and mo molecules that are talking to each other and enzymes that are interacting with substrates and all these types of things. And so how do, um, how do these molecules and these electrons and protons know how to interact with each other? And they know via the electromagnetic spectrum that is being provided wirelessly from the sun, from the earth to our body. Um, and one such example is kind of just the, the quantum spin of um, electrons, the quantum spin of various protons and how they are changed based on the, electro the electromagnetic spectrum that we are exposing ourselves to. I mean, the electromagnetic spectrum is a, it's, it's a broad range. I and mean, when we're talking about microwaves and radio waves through to ultraviolet, visible light, infrared light onwards to X-rays, gamma rays, etc. But I mean, we can only see zero point, I think, zero zero three five percent of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And so, I one of my big messages is that we have to trust in what we can't see, because we we can't see things for a reason. Because if we could see what UV light and infrared light would do to us, its quantum effects would be diminished. Um, this is called the observer effect or the quantum Zeno effect, um, where when you are uh, when you are observing a quantum event when you measure it, it stops behaving like it in a quantum way. And so there's a reason why we can't see these spectrums and frequencies, but there's a reason that we need to expose ourselves to these as well. Mm. Yeah, look, you know, we're getting, you've mentioned electrons a few times and it is interesting because we all studied biochemistry back at undergraduate level. Uh, we couldn't wait to finish it because, you know, why, why did we study biochemistry? because we had to study it to get through second year to get to third year. And that seemed the most, the most important reason why we studied it. And I think an opportunity was missed there because it just happens to be the way the body works. And uh, one of the things that uh, we learnt about was electron transport uh, and uh, the role of the mitochondria. You talked about energy as well and, you, and the role of mitochondria. So, yes. yeah, I thought we might just give us a little bit of mitochondria 101. Sure, sure. I mean, coming back to what you were saying firstly about biochemistry, I mean, as health clinicians and, and people that are on a health journey, we need to understand that biology is fundamentally applied chemistry, which we refer to as biochemistry. But that biochemistry is actually biophysics. And, that, and, and the biophysics is underpinning what is happening with the organic chemistry and the carbon chemistry and that biophysics is quantum physics it's not newtonian classical physics um so i mean so the stage for where all of this happens where we are interacting with our environment is the mitochondria um and so i mean the mitochondria is like a it's an organelle inside inside our cells um we uh took it several million years ago in into our cell and started to use it for energy production um, through a process called uh, endosymbiosis. Um, and uh, it's commonly thought of as like the power plant of the cell because it's producing energy. But um, really, it's also an environmental sensor. Um, so there's two membranes, and the inner membrane has got five proteins, which are referred to as cytochromes. And these cytochrome proteins are actually uh, light receptors for frequencies of light from the sun. Um, for instance, cytochrome 1 is a UV light receptor. Cytochrome 4 and 5 are red light receptors. And so they are sensing the electromagnetic frequencies that they are receiving from the sun. And then they are syncing that with the electron spins that they are, um, that they are sensing through the input into the electron transport chain. Because like electrons are going in not fats, not carbs, not proteins, electrons are going in and they are quantum leaping from entering in from either one or two, the first or second cytochrome and working their way through to oxygen. And as they're quantum leaping, um, the mitochondria are kind of checking their quantum spin and coupling that to the environment that we are exposing ourselves to. Um, and so uh, it's, it's quite magical what mitochondria do. Um, they reverse the process of photosynthesis. So one of the outputs of mitochondria is water, and that's maybe something which we can touch on later. But um, uh, as the electrons are passing through the electron transport chain, inevitably some will escape. 
And this is kind of in line with the second law of thermodynamics, where we lose energy to our environment. We lose, we create entropy or begin chaos. Um, and so inflammation is really an excess loss of electrons as they are quantum leaping from the first or second through to through to oxygen. So the goal of an optimal health journey is to reduce how much you are leaking to your environment because we do fundamentally need some free radicals from the mitochondria to escape so that they can signal DNA for and, and guide genetic expression. But we can't have too much because then the thermodynamic efficiency of the whole system breaks down and we lose something called redox, which is reduction oxidation potential, which is the ability for us to transfer electrons from one molecule to another, from one protein to another. And once we lose redox in a, in a cell and then in a tissue, that's kind of when disease be begins in that particular tissue. And we, we, we refer to it as inflammation, but... Uh, as I said earlier on, I like to define things. So I, I regularly ask health clinicians to define inflammation. And okay. no one can really, well, not many can really say it definitively in their own mind. Now, I might be wrong, but um, I'm confident that inflammation really is uh, an excess loss of electrons to your environment as they're trying to leap from uh, through the various cytochromes. Um, or it could also be an excess number of protons inside your system. Um, so to me, that's what inflammation looks like. And um, one of my mentors, um, his name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich, and um, he, uh, he beautifully structured the idea of stress as a framework for me, where there's five main stressors, and they are nutritional, environmental, emotional, um, postural, and dental. He's a bit biased because he's a dentist, so he chucked in dental. But um, <laughs> Music to my ears, uh, Jalal, but go on. That's an unpaid commercial, folks. <laughs> <laughs> but, Thanks for that. But really, these, um, these five stressors cause oxidative stress at the cellular level. And so what's oxidation? Um, back to high school chemistry, one of the things that I learned was something called oil rig, which is oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. And so oxidative stress is oxidation of the of the cells of the tissues it's rust and it's fundamentally a loss of electrons so i mean mitochondria is the stage at which we we interact with the with our environment and if things go wrong and if we decouple from nature which is very common in our modern lives that's when we start to see a loss of redox in our mitochondria which flows onto the tissues, inflammation. And to me, that's the bedrock of majority of chronic Neolithic disease that we're seeing these days. And people are stuck in this paradigm of um, genetics and um, food and, and exercise. And I mean, don't get me wrong, eating healthy food is, is critical to one's um, health journey, as is, as is exercise and the right type of exercise and timing your exercise correctly and in, in line with circadian principles. But in, ad in addition to that, if people are, are, are not going further and looking at their light environment, they're, they're not going to make much of a, a, of a headway into um, their optimal health journey and increasing their longevity. Mm. <clears throat> well, I know, I think uh, I've been reading a book uh, called Brain Energy from Chris Palmer, who's been a psychiatrist, talking about the importance of mitochondria on so many different levels. Uh, in terms of regulating hormones, in terms of uh, regulating expression of DNA, et cetera, et cetera. But you've mentioned <clears throat> the five proteins, the cytochrome, and there's a cytochrome uh, process that goes on. And, um, and that there's also a production. And, and also, interestingly, you said it's the opposite of photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is taking carbon dioxide and water, CO2 and H2O, and converting that to carbohydrate, CHO, and, and oxygen. oxygen. And so the, sun, the sunlight is actually splitting the water splitting into hydrogen and oxygen, which frees up electrons to fuel the electron transport chain that's happening in chloroplasts. Yes. And I mean, a new discovery for me recently was that that actually happens inside us as well. So we are photosynthetic beings because of melanin is photosynthetic. When sunlight strikes our melanin, it splits water inside our melanin 
into hydrogen and oxygen and releases four electrons. And those four electrons are free to do whatever they need to do or whatever they're signaled to do by the environment. Um, and to me, that's just beautiful. I mean, it also begs the question, like, uh, is all the oxygen that is inside our body from physical respiration or is some of the oxygen inside our body created from the photosynthesis of splitting of water inside our melanin? And um, there are some who believe that the latter has an important role to play in the oxygenation of our tissues. Um, so, I mean, that's a, something which I'm definitely going to look more into. I mean, the other exciting thing about mitochondria is that there's other proteins um, on the inner membrane as well called uncoupling proteins. And so basically, um, just to rewind back to the electron transport chain, as, they are quant as the electrons are um, quantum tunneling through the electron transport chain, um, along the way, protons are being pumped into the space between the first and uh, b between both membranes, and the protons then develop a bit of a gradient where they're more concentrated on one side and they're less concentrated on the other side of the inner membrane. So they want to kind of work their way down to the area where there's less protons, and so there's two ways for it to happen. The protons can come down through cytochrome five, which is ATPase, which results in the production of ATP, which we think is energy in quote, um, quotation marks for a reason. We'll touch on that later, perhaps. But um, the other way that they can funnel down is through uncoupling proteins. And when they funnel down through uncoupling proteins, that's when we produce infrared light. And that infrared light changes the water inside our cells, which then allows us to heat up from the inside. It shrinks our mitochondria. And as it shrinks the mitochondria, the cytochromes, which might be this far apart, are a lot closer now. So then it's easier for electrons to quantum leap from um, from one cytochrome to the next. So, um, I mean, the mitochondria have different haplotypes as well. So haplotypes is kind of like whether or not it's a coupled or an uncoupled mitochondria. So people with fairer skin tend to have uncoupled mitochondria and they use electrons from food to create protons in the into membrane space and those protons are then used predominantly for uh, through the uncoupling protein to produce heat and why are they fairer because they're further away from the equator which means it's colder there's less uv light and so they need to produce heat in order to continue to survive rather than atp or energy and so you look at the diets of people that are in Nordic regions, it's, um, it's high in fat, um, it's high in seafood, because those areas, I mean, fat's heavily dense in electrons. I think it's 130 odd ATP per, um, per unit of fat or mole of fat compared to, um, per, per molecule of fat compared to 36 ATP from one molecule of glucose. So there's a reason we're producing way more energy output from fat because it's so much more electron dense. So, but if you're in a Nordic area, it's freezing cold, you're eating seafood, the protons are coming down through un uncoupling proteins, which allow you to produce infrared light or heat inside of you. That's how you survive. Right. And um, so it's understanding the mitochondrial biology, how it defines where we should be living and where we should not be living and what we should be eating and what we should not be eating. Um, because, I mean, carbs should not be eaten in winter. That's a controversial statement, but um, uh, it really boils down to light inputs and electrons. Mm. <clears throat> wow. I mean, look, as, you, as you're talking and, uh, you know, I mentioned that we learnt, we learnt about biochemistry and physics early in our, in our education in health and, and in high school, really, because in high school we learned a bit about physics, we learned about photosynthesis, we learned about respiration, we learned that in biology. It's it's interesting, isn't it, that we've drifted not only so far away from the connection to the earth and natural forces, but also culturally, we're not living where we've evolved to over many millennia to live and adapt to. That's another challenge that we've thrown up, and we're going to come back to how we might address some of that. But I want to just talk about water for a moment because you said uh, oxygen in our body isn't just coming from the oxygen that we've, uh, we've inhaled, uh, but also through this melanin potentially photosynthetic process. 
But water's another one, isn't it? The, the water that really matters, if you like, is not necessarily coming from the water we drink. Yeah, spot on. Um, I mean, water's, water's magical. There's, there's, it's no surprise that water is regarded as life um, because its ability to fuel life and create life is, is magical. It's incredible. So, like, I mean, what happens with, with water uh, is our mitochondria produce water through cytochrome 4 and uh, as electrons reach the oxygen um, which is sitting there at cytochrome 4 and the proton joins to it we get this deuterium depleted water and um, this is something which has been shown by uh, people such as uh, Gerard Pollock and previous uh, research through Gilbert Ling um, it's been shown to charge separate under the influence of infrared light now the sun is 42 percent infrared light and so charge separation fundamentally means that we're able to separate the water inside our body into two phases and one is a, a electronegative phase which is known as exclusion zone water ez water and the other is a bulk water phase which is kind of more akin to the liquid water that that we drink and so cellular hydration or body hydration has got nothing it's got little to do with how much we are drinking. I mean, it's obviously important that we drink water, but more to thirst rather than a set number of two liters per day. And it's our hydration um, at a cellular level is more about how much water we are producing, which depends on mitochondrial function. And at the same time, us charge separating that water into the negative, negatively charged exclusion zone water and the positively charged bulk water. And so when you get a positive and a negative, and this exclusion zone water is a liquid crystal, um, which is a fourth phase of matter. This is why this is called fourth phase water. It's hydrophilic, which um, it, it attaches to hydrophilic molecules such as proteins, enzymes. So pretty much every protein in the body is wrapped in this exclusion zone water. And the most ubiquitous protein inside our body is collagen. And so if collagen, which is in our bones, it's in our, um, it's in our tendons, ligaments, um, it's in our skin, it's in our in connective tissue, fascia, everywhere. If that is all entirely wrapped in water, which is charge separated, and the magnetic field of the earth is able to align all of the liquid crystals so that they're all in sync, this creates literally like a quantum communication highway. And when you have a positive and a negative with collagen acting as the wire, you have an electrical circuit. And that is actually the source of energy for us. And the communication of information through this quantum communication highway is faster than, than, than that of nerve conduction. And um, it's, uh, I mean, we can't read enough about water. Um, this this uh, charge separation of water is, um, I guess, it's structured water as well. And so mm. it's a structuring of water through the exposure of um, infrared light, which um, is critical to longevity, well-being, improving quantum coherence inside our body. And there's a reason why things like red light therapy are important. Mm. We, yes, we're going to come back to that, but still sticking with the water for a sec because I... I think uh, one of the manifest, you know, whenever we are looking, for example, at cancer, you know, one of the features of a cancer is that it's palpable, that you can feel it, that you can run your finger over, not all cancers, obviously, but, you know, people, for example, with breast cancer can feel a lump in their breast or testicular cancer. Te you know, what they're actually feeling there are cells that no longer have a well-functioning easy liquid crystal water isn't it really i mean that's what's going on that's what's you know? going on and also cells that have um don't have the ability to undergo apoptosis i'll explain which is, that, that which, term, is, yeah. which is programmed cell death mm -hmm. so when you have a an um, a molecule a cell that's misbehaving that doesn't have the cues to undergo programmed cell death it can continue to self-replicate and that's when that's when cancer starts to mm. ex explode um it's it's concerning 
what's going on in society with cancer rates, um, as well as the age at which people are, are getting cancer. And um, to think that cancer is genetic and to think that um, to ignore much about environment and um, um, it's it, it, it worries me because in 1924, um, Otto von Warburg worked out that there's a Warburg shift that occurs in cancer cells, where which is essentially anaerobic glycolysis. And um, if we are going to try and win this cancer war, so to speak, um, we really need to revisit that and understand more of the role that deuterium and uh, mitochondria um, play in the um, proliferation of cancer. Hmm. I mean, it's so interesting to think about that water not just as changing the nature of the cell itself in terms of its feel, but that liquid crystal water also protects the DNA, doesn't it? I mean, that's a really important part, and which is so interesting because cancer, there are two schools of thought, and the vast majority of people in this field think cancer is a genetic disease. But a growing number of people feel, actually, there's, yes, it's obviously affecting genes, but there's more to it than that. Why are genes affected? It's actually a metabolic disease. And and coming back to, which is all about mitochondria and water and all of that, and coming back to that book, uh, Chris Palmer's book, he's talking about mental health as being a metabolic mitochondrial disease. So what we're talking about here in terms of quantum biology uh, and quantum physics and how that how the rubber hits the ground at cell level is really important. It, it may not be easy to wrap your head around and it may give you a bit of a clue as to why most doctors and health professionals would prefer to forget about it because the prescription pad is a much easier concept to get your head around. But there is another way of looking at health, isn't there? 100%. And uh, as you said, it's hard to wrap one's head around. So leave that to the quantum health clinicians or the health clinicians that are wanting to go down this rabbit hole so that we can do the hard yards and work out what is the way for one to live optimally and um, and then give you a personalised blueprint of how to achieve that. Mm. Now, you mentioned, uh, you know, the sun and food and earth. So let's talk a little bit about light here because... Uh, you know, it has been demonised. I mean, apparently this thing that's 93 million miles away is to be feared, loathed and avoided at all costs. And yet, where is my phone? Uh, this thing that uh, is emitting radiation, and we'll talk about that in a moment, no problem at all. Let's come back to why sun is actually, it has been, I think if evidence is anything to go by, the last, oh, I don't know, four or five billion years is reasonable proof that sun has played an important role in that journey. Tell us a bit more about sunlight and some of the problems we've thrown up now with the alternative forms. Yes, I mean, the sun is its a source of all energy on this earth. That's an unequivocal fact. And if somebody struggles to see that, then we have a long way to go. Um, and so if it's a source of all energy on this earth um, and we have evolved under the sun, um, then we need to learn how to utilize it correctly. And I guess the misnomer is, is that uh, sun causes skin cancer, when in reality there's studies that have come out, I think it was from Sweden in 2016, which kind of um, showed that like all-cause mortality increases with reduced sun exposure. Now, I'm not saying to go and spend 12 hours in the sun straight in, you know, in the hot Australian sun with the strong UVB, et cetera. I'm saying to use it responsibly. And so you, what's happening is people are going from zero to a hundred kilometers an hour. They're working in their offices all day long. They'll pop out for, at lunchtime, have a bite to eat. Oh, the sun's so strong. And then they'll just go back in. Whereas they're not learning the basics of how to generate um, an ability to um, handle sunlight exposure, you can build a solar callus, which um, increases your ability to absorb UV light. You can, um, and you need the sun for um, not just to um, to run your mitochondria, but also just from a circadian biology perspective as well, because I mean, circadian biology is something I'm very passionate about. Um, but I mean, just like, uh, uh, I, I mean, I'm a, life is all about polarities. We need to have polarities such as male and female, 
contentious topic these days with gender fluidity and all. But um, uh, there's male and female, there's black and white. Water itself, which um, a lot of people regard as life, water is a dipolar molecule. Um, and so when it comes to circadian biology, we need to have light and we need to have an absence of light. We need to have dark. But what's happened is, is that we are living in artificial blue light indoors all the time um, during the day. And we're avoiding the sun and we're wearing sunglasses and we're wearing sunscreen. Um, and then come, come evening time, uh, when the sun goes down, we should be trying to mimic that. And um, what we are doing is we're living under this same artificial blue light right up until when we're time uh, when it's time to go to sleep. We're in front of screens, whether they be TVs, phones, um, laptops, etc. And uh, we're exposing ourselves to these non-native electromagnetic frequencies, of which blue light is one, Wi-Fi is another, 4G, 5G. We can't really escape that, so to speak, but we can mitigate. And um, we just need to start making better choices about the light environment that we are exposing ourselves to. And by light environment, I'm not just saying the light that we can see, but also the light that we can't see. Because for instance, when we go to sleep, our brain um, alpha waves resonate at 7.83 hertz, which is 7.83 waves per second. That's the same as the Schumann resonance between the Earth's core and the ionosphere. But Wi-Fi is 2.4 billion waves per second, 2.4 gigahertz. So we've got 7.83 waves, 2.4 billion. So it's a simple 1% changes like turning your Wi-Fi off when you go to sleep, uh, a key to changing your light environment and improving your circadian rhythm. And this, um, this blue light that I was talking about earlier, I mean, that's, a, that, that's something which we really need to raise awareness about. Hmm. You said something that was, I think, there was quite a few things you said there that was so important, but one of them, and I think this is worth repeating about all-cause mortality. All-cause mortality is a measure of all causes of death. And so all causes of death go up as our exposure to the sun goes down. Skin cancer may go down. Well done. Well done on skin cancer. But if you die of colon cancer, brain cancer, breast cancer, skin, you know, like you name any other cancer that people have, not to mention cardiovascular disease, autoimmune conditions, and you die from any of those, that's part of the all-cause mortality statistic but skin cancer will go down. So, you know, this is a very reductionist way of looking at things. You mentioned solar callus preparing the body for sunlight. Tell us a little bit about that. How does one prepare one's, you know, how do we do that? Well, there's got to be some secrets we keep for ourselves. Um, <laughs> but look, to start with, um, when I say secrets, secrets that pe people reach out to us and, um, and we educate them on how to do it properly. Um, but fundamentally, we need more morning sun because when we are exposing ourselves to morning sun, early morning sun, watching sunrises, that um, is predominantly infrared light and little UV, if any, that chart separates the water inside our body, which um, acts as a capacitor to absorb UV light later on. There's a lot of factors in building a solar callus. Um, melanin has a role to play um, and... Uh, if anyone wants to reach out to learn more, I'm more than happy to explain that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. The other thing you said that I think is worth mentioning because you mentioned it right up front, and that was that uh, we the, we get our nourishment from food, from sun, food including water, food and sun and the earth. And you drew that in, that comparison between our the frequency of our brain waves when we're going to sleep, the alpha waves, if you like, 7.83 hertz, which is the same as the Earth's frequency. What a coincidence, isn't that? Just what a coincidence. How did that ever happen? You know, like we've spent millions of years on this Earth and we're in sync with the frequency of the Earth, 7.83 hertz. And then you gave a statistic about Wi-Fi radiation, which I think I wrote down correctly, 2.4 gigahertz. Yes, how much bigger is it? Is that than how many millions times more? It's millions times more, isn't it? Billions. It's billions 2, times two, more. Two point four billion waves. Yes. So divided what, by eight. 
Um, yeah, which so, why, why would that even be an issue? You can hardly imagine a, you know, I, I, it kind of raises an alarm bell for me thinking we've drifted so far from that earth frequency that we've evolved with over millions of years of 7.83 and now we're bathing ourselves in billions times more and yet we're being told that that doesn't have any effect at all. The sun's what we should worry about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's um go figure oh my go, God. go figure but i mean what really happens at a cellular level is that it dehydrates our cells it impacts the mitochondria's ability to produce water add to that an absence of sunlight so you can't charge separate and structure that water add to that calcium efflux from the cells and you just start to get cellular breakdown um, and we could go into things like DHA and um, how that is needed to repair cell membranes and stuff like that, but we get technical. Um, but, I mean, really, I mean, it's it's changing the light environment, um, as we've touched on, and, I mean, this blue light and what it does to our dopamine levels and melatonin um, and, and stuff, it's, it's critical that we address the blue light situation. Mm. Now, <clears throat> you've talked about cells making energy and making water, but uh, cells do even more than that. They, they produce light. How, how does that happen and, and why does it happen? So cells produce light to signal other cells and to signal other tissues via this quantum communication water highway that I was talking about. Um, and they're signaling what's going on and they're able to signal other molecules um, about what's going on and that molecule might gravitate towards another molecule accordingly. So um, there are various forms of this ultra-low frequency UV light. Um, one form is the free radicals that are being released from the electron um, transport chain inside our mitochondria. Another example is how UVA and infrared light are interacting with deuterium in our blood plasma and that results in the release of UVC light. And... Um, I mean, melatonin is a, a topic that's frequently covered in the health space. But a lot of people are not really thinking from a biophysics standpoint that melatonin is made from an aromatic amino acid called tryptophan, which has a peak absorption of 280 nanometers, which is in the borderline UVC, UVB range. And the thing is that barely any UVC gets down to Earth from the sun. We are protected from it by the Earth's surface. If tryptophan that results in the eventual production of melatonin has a peak absorption in the UVC range and we are getting little UVC from the sun, how are we actually making melatonin then? And that's because we make UVC light ourselves. And the same, the same goes for dopamine. Dopamine is made from tyrosine, which is another aromatic amino acid which is um, at 274 nanometers is, is its peak absorption. So it's well into the UVC range. So, um, I mean, it's, it's beautiful to think that we ourselves are emitting light, which is resulting in the activation of hormones to do what they need to do on time in line with circadian biology. And I also think just from a social standpoint, you walk into a room, sometimes you, you get a good vibe or a, a not so good vibe from somebody else. And I interpret that as us reading the light that is being released by that person. And um, our gut, our, that gut feeling, yes, it could be very well coming from the gut, but it's also a water feeling. I think it's our water in our body sensing that UV, ultra low frequency UV light and deciding is this person something that we gel, um, someone that we gel with or not. It's pretty mm. cool. It is very cool. And you mentioned the gut. And of course, our friend, Dr. Pran Yoganathan, when I asked him, is the gut the second brain, he disagreed, which resulted in a pregnant pause on my part. I was just waiting for it. And he said, no, the gut's the first brain. Um, but uh, <clears throat> pushing on, uh, you know, Jalal, you, you mentioned I'm your mentor, but you, you know, we're going to rub each other, uh, pat each other on the back here because we've been mentoring each other. And uh, you've introduced me to quantum dentistry. And I, I always thought sleep and breathe were foundational pillars, but I now realize quantum biology, quantum physics, biochem you know, is, is foundational. Tell us, you are a dentist, as am I, and isn't it exciting to hear two dentists talk just basic dentistry, just, 
you know, are you brushing and flossing, you know, just we have to put that out for the listener because this is what dentistry is about in the 21st century. Tell us about quantum dentistry. How does that look? So quantum dentistry for me is a, um, a paradigm of dentistry that I'd like to take the industry towards or play my role in doing so. And it's understanding that um, the teeth are an important part of the body. And I mean, the mouth is the gateway to the human body. It's the gateway to the gut. That's how we start to interact with food. Um, and yes, there's a there's a very important aspect of jaws and jaw development, how that inf- affects the airway behind. Jaws have a huge role to play in um, in posture, particularly the lower jaw position. And so all of these things um, are part of the the structure with which I look at someone's um, system. But in addition to that, every tooth sits on a meridian, an acupuncture meridian. And those acupuncture meridians are essentially the various quantum communication highways of the water networks. And so sometimes a diseased tooth or a tooth with pathology could be causing a systemic infection or systemic issue and vice versa. And so quantum dentistry is looping in not only my understanding of quantum biology, but um, coupling that to my um, clinical abilities as a dentist to just verify whether or not a tooth could be causing systemic issues or vice versa. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very exciting um, place that we're headed. Uh, we have something called a GDV camera, which enables us to um, measure within 30 to 60 seconds someone's quantum coherence. Um, and uh, it allows us to see if they are losing light to their environment um, from any part of their body. And then we're able to correlate that with any signs and symptoms that they report on a on a medical history um, questionnaire and discussion and, and couple that to what we're seeing in the mouth um, to see if there's a correlation. And sometimes nothing eventuates from it, which is fine. At least we checked. But sometimes um, we get some quite startling uh, correlations and uh, a dental intervention could have a huge role to play in um, alleviating someone of a, of a systemic issue. Um, root canals are a hot topic, and I'm not necessarily completely against root canals. I think they have their place. Um, but uh, if there's a, a root canal which might look perfectly good on an x-ray but is in line with a meridian that is upsetting a correlating um, systemic tissue, then um, maybe there's an indication to re-examine whether or not that tooth should be removed or not. Hmm. So that's hmm. kind of the uh, approach with which I'm looking at the mouth now. And I think um, one recent thing which I discovered was um, as, a, as a dentist, I'm, I'm sure throughout the years you would have measured the electrical conductivity inside teeth to determine whether or not a, a nerve is vital to decide if uh, this if, if this tooth is um, exhibiting signs of an infection. Um, but sometimes you'll find that an entire arch or an entire corner of the mouth has very little conductivity to cold or to electrical stimulus. And if someone's entire mouth is low in conductivity, that tells me that they don't have quantum coherence throughout their entire system because there's just no electrical transduction through the teeth. Interesting. If if there is an individual tooth, that's a different story. But if someone's entire mouth doesn't have that electrical conductivity, that's a, that's a, for me, a a red flag about a growing, um, uh, it's a red flag about a, uh, I might just start that again. No, no. Well, you know, you're talking about a dis, dis, out of coherence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, for me, it's uh, someone that's decoherent, incoherent, and yeah. um, it warrants further investigation. Mm, mm. No, no. I, you, we, we were ta- we met recently, and you pointed out some of the reports, and I'm certainly exploring this myself. This GDV camera, which picks up very, very subtle. Um, changes in in output from an individual giving you clues. I mean, I, I think it's it's brilliant. You know, it's very exciting development. So now, listen, just before we came on, we were talking about uh, your recent uh, discovery journey into regenerative agriculture and this whole decentralization of food, et cetera, et cetera, and control. And I and I think uh, you know we've done programs on lo- on globalization and localization and i think if the last two or three years of the pandemic have taught us anything 
relying on global networks to uh, sustain us and keep us in the way that we'd like to become accustomed, it's a little bit tenuous. Tell us a little bit about decentralization as you understand it. So decentralization is something which I'm very passionate about. And um, it's it, it does it has kind of developed over the last couple of years, given um, what's happened with um, you know some of the threats to food security and, and whatnot. Um, and so rather than wait for the uh, authorities or powers that be um, guide us in the right direction, I thought um, that it was about time I regain some sovereignty and some responsibility and um, uh, take matters into my own hands. So I've been quite active in um, understanding more about what decentralization looks like and um, seeking to build a network accordingly. And to me, um, decentralization really fundamentally boils down to people taking responsibility for themselves, for their health, for their food security, for their shelter, for their community, and um, also eliminating any counterparty risk so that, um, I mean, if you are obtaining food directly from the farmer, then there's virtually no counterparty risk. Um, if you go and shake a farmer's hand and you go and meet them in person and you understand, you go, spend a day with them, understand how they're going about doing things. Um, I just did that last weekend and it was such an empowering experience for me. Um, it was such an exciting experience for me that I, uh, I'm so excited. Um, I'm so excited about knowing who is uh, producing um, the food that my family will eat, that my children will eat. Um, I was down at Albury, New South Wales, um, at w Wolke Farm, and um, Jacob Wolke, who's um, the farmer there, is just an absolutely brilliant guy. And I encourage everybody to um, see what what he is doing, as as are the likes of Charlie Arnott um, and, and others in the regenerative agriculture space, because. These gentlemen are really taking matters into their own hands um, with uh, restoring nutrition um, into the foods that we are eating, um, reducing the um, processed nature of food and the chemicals that are being used. And um, I've spoken a lot about light um, today, but uh, food is still very important. Um, and uh, we need to have nutritious food that is clean, that is um, good for our microbiome, and it can allow our microbiome to flourish. Um, so building these decentralized food networks, these decentralized networks with health is something I'm very passionate about. And, um, I like to think that there's a quantum revolution that is, uh, slowly developing as people rouse from their slumber and, um, start to take matters into their own hands. Um, I feel grateful that I have risen, that I have woken up, um, and, um, and I hope, uh, I can play my role in, in waking up others. Yeah. Yes. Well, look, it's music to my ears and uh, actually talk about music to my ears. There's a truck sat right outside my window there uh, with who seems to have fallen on his horn. But anyway, I'm going to push on because we're, you know, we live in a real world and things aren't in the studios. But um, but that is music to my ears because it's been something that I've been passionate about for a very long time. And I realised and I remember Charlie Massey saying um, sustainability is not enough because what are we sustaining? A, a, a degraded landscape. What we have to do is regenerate it. And we've spoken recently to Zach Bush, who has a whole vision of how that can roll out. Listen, um, people have been listening to this and it would have piqued a lot of people's interest. It's a, a great follow on talk from uh, the discussion we had with Jason Borden Smith uh, that I pulled out of the archives a few weeks ago. If if a, li a listener was starting on this journey, what how what would you recommend for a listener to do? How should they start? What would be some takeaways? I think the um, I think the first thing would be to get as much morning sight as po uh, morning sun as possible, um, and try and do that every day. And it needs to be naked eyes, so no contacts, no glasses, no sunglasses, naked eyes, morning sun, and ideally as much skin showing as possible because our skin is a solar panel. Um, and so that small change is probably one of the biggest bangs for your buck, so to speak, in terms of turning one's optimal health journey around and getting their circadian biology back on track. And I think uh, on an optimal health journey, there is a lot of a focus on addition, but I think there also needs to be a focus on subtraction. 
And so we need to be subtractionists in um, changing our light environments at home, turning Wi-Fi off, blocking blue light, particularly after dark, wearing blue light blocking glasses when we are on tech. And um, <laughs> that's very timely, Dr. Ron. Um, I've got them but, right here, Jalal. But uh, blocking blue light, critical to preserving the circadian rhythm that we tried to build in the morning. And then the last thing I'd, uh, I'd recommend is... um. Start asking questions and start asking better questions because as you start to question things, um, the quantum realm will lead you to the answers. Um, fate is something which I regard as quantum entanglement. And uh, Rumi said many years ago that what you seek seeks you. And so if you start to change what you seek, if you start to seek the truth, then it will eventually arrive on your plate. And if you change your light environment and you reduce your blue light, you will be high on dopamine and you will be able to see the truth when it's presented in front of you. Mm. What a great note to finish on, Jalal. Tell me, where can listeners find you? Where can people find you? Tell us. Um, I'm on social media, Instagram and Twitter. K2 Calibre, C-A-L-I-B-R-E, is my handle. Um, I'd appreciate uh if you guys like what I'm talking about, to um, share it and um, and spread the word. Because if I'm honest, I'm not really big on followers. I don't even like the word followers. You're you're members of my tribe, so to speak. But it's more about spreading this important message of quantum physics, quantum biology, circadian biology, and really highlighting and illuminating the truth um, about what it takes to be optimally healthy, free of dogma, all based in physics and truth. Jalal, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing so much with us. It's an absolute pleasure, Ron. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I start every podcast with uh, an acknowledgement to country uh, and, and honouring our First Nations people. And I've also, I've always done that because of uh, I, the fact that I firstly truly believe we should acknowledge that in Australia. We have, have, have a terrible record of how we have dealt with and treated our First Nations people, and they have been extraordinarily gracious and forgiving. And I really believe we have so much to learn about their connection with the land and their respect for it and for each other, in fact, for the whole universe. It's, it's all connected. And um, here we are exploring something so fundamental that, uh, you know, this is about how we have evolved as a living being, of any living being. We have evolved on an earth that, uh, well, I love Jalal's, uh, that he is downloading from above and uploading from below. And that is how we have evolved. We have evolved by being able to do both those things, downloading from above the sunshine and drawing all of its energy and, uh, and its effect on every single cell in our body and uploading from the earth on which we have walked for millions of years. And we have become so disconnected from those two major forces that um, it has led to disease. And if we are wanting to explore health and wellness, and this is what I found so inspiring when I met Jalal, um, I, I just felt that, you know, I felt I had a holistic model of healthcare with all of the stresses on one hand and all of the pillars on health on the other, with our genes and how our genes express themselves on which the whole balancing beam pivots. But fundamental to every single stressor and every single pillar and every single gene and how they express themselves in the body is how a cell functions. And the influence that the sun and the earth have on that and the way we have tried to change that and, and, you know, look, I, I love all the technology that I am surrounded with. Um, but as I said, and I, and I actually do use these uh, blue blocking glasses when I sit at my desk and on my phone, I have an iPhone. And um, if you go to uh, access your settings, and I'll just walk you through this now because I think it's a particularly good thing to do. You go to settings. This is an iPhone. You go to accessibility. You go to uh, display and text and you scroll down. You really have to look for this, don't you? And you go to color filters and you'll know that is switched off. 
but you can switch color filters on and go then to color tint. And you can adjust the intensity. And once you've saved that, three short clicks on the side of your iPhone will give you access to switching that on and off at leisure. So again, I'll go through that again because I do think it's worthwhile. Settings, accessibility, display, scroll down to color filters, and then uh, activate color filters. And you will have put a color filter onto your phone, which you can turn on and off very quickly with three clicks. And there is something that is you're looking at all day and many, a lot of the night, and, and that is affecting your uh, melanopsin receptors in your eyes, particularly, but also in your skin. And the other thing is the LED lights. Now, he mentioned incandescent lights, which you may remember the light globes we used to have as we when, when I was growing up. They would be hot, and they were hot because they were down the red end of the spectrum, which generated heat. And here we have now LED lights that last forever or a long time, and they are cool, and they are blue because they're down the blue end of the spectrum. But of course, we are bathing ourselves, not just in the technology we uh, keep surrounding ourselves by, but in the light, way we choose to light our, our houses in this light, which has an, an ongoing effect. Look, this is a huge issue. Now, Jalal is a really inspirational character because he often, um, he, he has formed this dental truck and as he says in in his um, on the website, and we'll have links to his website. You know, in the city we have lots and lots of dentists available, but in outback Australia we have oftentimes none in remote communities. So he has a fully fledged clinic on wheels, where he and his team cross the outback from village to village and provide dental care to amazing people in spectacular places. How's this for a quote? The truck is an adventure in dentistry. Yes, Jalal is a dental nerd, an inspiring one, I would add. It's about exploration, self-development and helping people. It's the perfect way for Jalal to fulfill the promise he made to his children that he will always strive to be the best possible role model I, he can be. Now, Jalal's Instagram account is K2Calibre, that's C-A-L-I-B-R-E, that's K2, the letter, the, the letter uh, number two, Calibre, C-A-L-I-B-R-E. And I think it would definitely be worth following. And I'll have links to his dental truck. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.